Good evening to you. I am Carolyn Long. Thank you for joining us for this live tonight on Twitter and on YouTube. Tonight we're taking a closer look at the execution of Lisa Montgomery. She is scheduled to die tomorrow by lethal injection at the federal prison in Terre Haute, Indiana for the brutal murder of a young pregnant woman and then ultimately kidnapping her baby. Now our investigative reporter Angie Ricono has covered this story extensively through the years. Over the last 16 years, she joins us live now from Terre Haute. Angie, I know there has been a, a cry for a stay of execution here for months now. Anything here mm -hmm. in the last few minutes as we count down to this execution? No, what we're seeing is just this huge social media push for her online saying that this execution shouldn't take place because she has mental illness and because she had a life that was so full of abuse and torture. So right now what we have legally is there is a clemency petition that is before President Trump. And then also the attorneys are directly appealing to the court saying she has lost touch with reality. So therefore doing this execution in this moment would be unconstitutional. So we're watching those two items very closely. Mm -hmm. Now, Angie, I know we're kind of uh, talking about this, but I, again, this is something that happened many years ago, back in 2004. For right. those of you watching uh, right now with us and want to kind of refresh on, on what happened here 16 years ago in Skidmore, Missouri, let's go ahead and take a, a look, uh, a look back through the years. Good morning to you. It is 5 o'clock on this Friday, December 17th. A shocking story out of Skidmore, Missouri, where a young expectant mother is dead. Sometime yesterday, investigators say someone murdered that mother. In 2004, Bobby Jo Stinnett was strangled inside her Skidmore, Missouri home. Her unborn baby was cut from her stomach. An infant girl was brought to Stormont Vale Hospital in Topeka. The baby girl was later found almost three hours away in Melbourne, Kansas. The talk on this night centered on the house just south of town, Lisa Montgomery's house. Lisa Montgomery admits she did it. She went on trial and was convicted for murder and kidnapping. Montgomery has grabbed nationwide attention because she'll be the first woman to be executed at the federal level in almost 70 years. It's interesting to note the last female federal execution stemmed from a Kansas City crime. A six-year-old was kidnapped from his school and murdered. Bonnie Heady died in the gas chamber. She just was slowly broken down to where she fell apart. Montgomery supporters argue it's cruel and unjust to kill her due to her history. Montgomery has been diagnosed with bipolar, anxiety, PTSD, borderline personality, and psychosis. Doctors suspect traumatic brain injuries from car crashes and rapes. Testimony and old court documents back up claims of rape, torture, and neglect for almost all of her life. There are online petitions and even a song about how cruel her execution will be. But when they tie me to the chair Will you think it's fair? Will you think it's fair then? And in the morning when it's done Will you think you've won? What doesn't grab as much attention is the pain the Stennett family and the community of Skidmore has endured. This is one of those cases that haunts the investigators because we, we rarely see something this terrible. They remember how awful this was. A mother murdered and a baby grew up without ever getting to know her. Nothing about this day was typical. I mean, it's, just, it's just been really hard on everybody and the, uh, um, I guess everybody feels there's a better place and Bobby is, is there now. So we just feel for her family and her little girl. That baby recently celebrated her 16th birthday, which is the anniversary of her mother's brutal death. It brings back so many questions we had at that time and, and many of those questions I know we still have today. Angie, uh, let's go back to the motive Lisa Montgomery must have found. What have we, we learned about that over the years? Do we know at any point was she pregnant and maybe lost the child needed to 
kind of find a replacement or what was the what was the motive? Right. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of people wondered. It's like, who would do something like this? Why are you doing that? And we actually spoke with an expert about fetal abductions. And at first they thought it would be these women who couldn't have babies. And so then they're going out and they're abducting babies in this horrific manner that's even worse than a traditional kidnapping. But what they've learned is all of these women have already previously had a baby, so they know how to fake it. They know what to say. They're a little bit overweight, so it's kind of easy to believe they are pregnant. But in that moment when they're doing this, they're having some sort of fertility issue, but then they also have a relationship that is falling apart. So what they think in their mind is the way they can save this relationship is to say they are pregnant. And then they keep going down this road and then eventually they need to have a baby. And what we know about this case is there was tremendous planning and all of these women who commit these fetal abductions, they have all of this planning. It used to be that they would go into hospitals and they would be like looking in the hospitals to try to steal a baby. Well, they really hardened that target and you couldn't go in and abduct a baby that way. So then abductions have changed over the years. This is obviously like unbelievably extreme. But what they do know in all of those cases is those women didn't just go to the hospital and then have like one hospital, one target, I'm going in here. They really have a very comprehensive plan. And I know you covered this the morning this all happened. Um, what we knew later on is that Lisa Montgomery had bought clamps. She had bought a home birthing kit. She had done research on the internet about C-sections. So there was a lot of planning that went into this. And one thing that I didn't know until I went back and interviewed the sheriff, he was talking about how she made a dry run up to Skidmore the day before. And these two locations are not close at all. I mean, when you're talking about Skidmore, Missouri, and for people at home, that's that's north and it's over from St. Joe. And when you go over to Melbourne, Kansas, I mean, that's three hours away. I mean, that is quite a trip. Mm -hmm. Definitely had some planning involved here. And speaking of planning, how was oh, yeah. it? How was it, refresh my memory, that Lisa got to know Bobby Joe? I mean, how did that connection even happen? It was through dogs. They were both showing dogs. And so they meet. Lisa is obviously, um, she's telling people she's pregnant, but she's not really pregnant. But then Bobby Joe is pregnant. So they're at this dog show together and there's actually some old pictures that you see of them together. And so she knows that Bobby Joe is pregnant. And so that's how they solve the case. So you have to think back, you know, this is 16 years ago. Obviously people had computers, they had the internet, but when they're, they're coming in, I mean, it was like, how quickly can you find someone? It's not like a phone and you're pinging it in its location. But they go in and they check the computer and they know that Bobby Joe had been in this chat room discussing dogs and there had been an email back and forth about, okay, I'll come up, I'll bring you some baby clothes and yeah, I'll take a look at your dogs. And so Bobby Joe thinks someone is coming to her house where they have all of these things in common. They both are breeding the same dog and they're both pregnant. So this is somebody that she trusted. She had previously met this person, had mm. no idea that she was in any sort of danger when this all went down. And something else that I think is just really kind of kind of frightening and creepy is that they, they've kind of been able to put together a better timeline. And they know that Bobby Joe's mother called because Bobby Joe was late. And so there was an answering machine, because back then we all had answering machines that were you sure. know, out yeah. loud. And so Lisa Montgomery could hear the answering machine. And so that's when she had to start moving really quickly. So the, the murder had taken place, but then everything from that point, they suspect just moved really quickly. And Lisa's speeding out of town because she knows that Bobby Joe's mom is on her way down to the house. So some of the details of this crime are just unbelievable. And the sheriff, he said, you know, it's one of the most monstrous things he has ever been a part of and witnessed. And for him, when you talk to him, it's interesting because he's the sheriff now, but he was like the lead investigator. And he was on the team where they're trying to piece together what's happening and they know because of the computer, they know where the email was sent from, that it was sent from Melbourne, Kansas. And I don't know if you remember the Amber Alert that went out. Right, it was the Amber Alert for a fetus. for a fetus. Right. 
Oh, which is the only time they've ever done it. And it was actually controversial at the time because whenever you do Amber Alerts, you have to have a description. And we normally have pictures when there's children like, this child is missing, here's the suspect. You're trying to give people really good, clear information to go on. So and in this case, all they know is a baby is missing. And I don't even know if we knew at that time publicly if we knew if it was a boy or a girl they were searching for. We just knew it was a fetus that they were looking for. But someone in Melvern, Kansas called in as well. They had like two reasons to go there. So they've got the email and then someone calls in and says, hey, she's, she's, you know, there's this woman passing around a baby in town, walking around saying she had a baby and I, I, didn't, I didn't think she was pregnant. So they send the FBI first and they're watching this farmhouse. And the other thing that ties it all together for them really quickly is that they knew a red car had left town. Because you have to remember Skidmore is very small. So if you go there, people who don't normally live in that town, I mean, you stick out. And so somebody else that lived on the block where Bobby Joe lived remembered a red car and other people mm-hmm. in the town knew about the red car leaving quickly. So when they show up at this farmhouse, there's a red car. So by the time they go up and knock on that door, they have three pieces of information connecting them there. And now how so long was it's that? It's really impressive. From the time of the murder. They did this all within like 24 hours. I mean, it was so quick. So everything happens the first day, and she drives home, and she tells everybody. She she kept switching her story. At first, she had told everyone that she had given a baby in a birth, you know, given birth in a birthing center, mm-hmm. and so she comes home with the baby. So it's the next morning, and Lisa Montgomery was actually with her husband watching news coverage of this when the investigators showed up, and when they first showed up, they're trying to keep everything as calm as possible, according you know to the sheriff, because he said you know you don't want to agitate anyone, and when they walk in. Lisa is sitting there holding the baby. So they're trying to be calm and they're explaining to the husband, well, hey, we didn't know if maybe your wife had any information because she knew Lisa. And he describes how Lisa would stand up and walk around and she was like pretending that she was a mother who had just given birth, you know, that she was in pain, that it was difficult to walk, it was difficult to move. And when they they were questioning her, they separated her from the baby at some point just so they could talk to her. And then they started asking more questions like, okay, so you had a baby at the birthing center, where's, where's the paperwork? And then, of course, there is no paperwork. And then she says, well, it was actually a home birth, but we didn't have money, so, you know, there's no paperwork. And so everything kept changing. But they found just a tremendous amount of evidence in that car that quickly linked everything, and she did confess. The issue right now and why this is so controversial is, of course, you have the trial. And during the trial, people were aware that she had been sexually abused in her past. What her current legal team will tell you is nobody knew the extent of that sexual abuse. And to just say sexual abuse doesn't frame it correctly, that it was really more torture. Um, And I know we're on Twitter. A lot of the stuff that we've reported, we've tried to be really careful because at 4, 5, and 6, and even at 10 o'clock at night, we don't want to be giving the graphic information. We have... If you go back and look at our investigations online, we're putting the legal documents. So if people want to learn more, but what what they are saying is that she was just basically tortured her whole life, that she had a stepfather who gang raped her with his friends and that she has brain damage from those violent attacks where they would beat her head on the floor. And then she also was in car crashes and some other injuries. So they're saying, like, if you look at your, her brain scan, you can tell her brain is different. And that's one of the big arguments the attorneys argue is, you know, you can't fake a brain scan. We know she has brain damage. And then since being incarcerated, she has been diagnosed with numerous conditions, um, bipolar disorder, psychosis, borderline personality disorder, PTSD, and it's interesting because this trial, Carolyn, you know, that was the trial was 14 years ago. Mm-hmm. And, you know, things have changed in the last 14 years. Actually, during the trial, they were arguing they didn't know if she really had PTSD because she might have been a willing participant in her sexual abuse. And so it was almost like mitigated away during trial. So you've got the two sides arguing, but the federal government, they had some experts saying, well, we really don't know how damaged she is because maybe maybe she was okay with what happened with the stepfather. 
So it was later that they have been able to piece together different moments um, and how horrific her abuse was. They also say her mom, when they needed money, would just traffic her. So mm -hmm. some of that information, Lisa originally did not give up in the first trial and people weren't aware of. They're piecing together this information from her sister, her half-sister. Um, there's also a relative who was a police officer who has stepped forward and said that this information is true. And then it's also in some old court documents because Lisa's mother eventually divorces the stepfather and that divorce, um, in the paperwork there, they talk about the sexual abuse. But nobody steps in and gives her therapy. And so that's why you're seeing all of this stuff online for Save Lisa because it's like, where were, where were the safety nets? Where were the teachers? Where was this police officer? Where was the courts? You know, you've got this this young girl who's going through all these horrific things in life and someone should have, someone should have been clued in, someone should have known. And they even point out like her school records, like her school records, she's, she's a top student. And then all of a sudden she needs to be in like special classes. Mm -hmm. They're like, where, how do you go from here to here? And, um, you know, it, it was different back then. And a lot of people are just, they have sympathy for her because of what she has been through. But of course, I just, you know, also feel so bad for the, the Stennett family, Bobby Joe's family, mm -hmm. because they have been through, I don't even know if you can even explain what they have been through. You've got this unbelievable murder where her mom walks in and finds her. Oh, yeah. The baby's mm -hmm. kidnapped, right? And, mm -hmm. and then you have to deal with the trial, and it's two years before you even have the trial. Mm -hmm. So then they've waited 14 years for this execution. So since October, you've had an execution date that was set, and then it was delayed, and then it was canceled, and now it's back on. So we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Wait and see what happens. Yeah, in addition, now the Stinnett family going through this period as well as they await tomorrow's uh, day as well. Oh. And there's so much to talk to you about um, and, and so many questions we have about this child who amazingly survived and is now a teenager. But right. I know you have a special planned uh, tonight for our news at 10 o'clock. Tell us more about that. We're going to be taking a look, a comprehensive look at some of these different pieces of how we got here. We're looking back on the case, but we're also going to be hearing directly from Diane Mattingly, and that is the half-sister of Lisa Montgomery. We're also going to be speaking with an expert on fetal abductions. There's actually, like I said, a term for, for that. And then we're also looking at the history of executions in women. Um, Lisa will be the first woman at the federal level to be executed in almost 70 years. And the most recent case has a Kansas City connection. That was Bonnie Heady for um, the little boy Bobby who was kidnapped and murdered. So for a lot of reasons, I mean, this is, this is news, this is historic, this is sad, this is awful, but we know it's important. And so that's why we're doing this special tonight and that's why we're here for the coverage because we know being here in person and having the direct information is the best way to cover it. Absolutely. We will stay tuned tonight for the execution of Lisa Montgomery tonight on KCTV 5 News tonight at 10 o'clock. Angie Racono live from Terre Haute, Indiana. We thank you for joining us and we'll continue to follow your reports mm -hmm. from Indiana in the next 24 hours. Sounds good. Thanks, Carolyn.